Hello Paris, hello Type Talks, very happy to have you tonight. We have two talk tonight with uh, Julie Soudan who will present for these very good people. So uh, having fun, uh, Julie. Thank Presenting you. Uh, Laura and uh, Thomas on I don't know. Hugo. <laughs> Hugo, <laughs> bye bye. Hello everyone. Uh, thank you for being here tonight and thank you Jean-Francois to, to create this kind of events. Um, it's the second night of Thai Papari Talks tonight and uh, Rijan Dalbeyo and Alex Trochu as well introduced um, last uh, week the season of talks. And tonight we have um, two guests that is really interested too. So um, the first time I heard about her, uh, it was several years ago with uh, the book uh, Tipo Mag at the beginning of my formation. And uh, she's a award-winning graphic and type designer. So I'm really proud to introduce you, Laura Messeger. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, welcome in Paris. Merci. Um, you are from Barcelona yes. and you are based in Amsterdam now. Yeah, yeah. sort of. Yeah. Kind of. <laughs> and uh, you began by studying design graphic and uh, after you did the uh, type media. Yeah. <laughs> type media course in Netherlands. Um, you won a lot of prizes with your typeface like with a magazine, Umba, La Lola, Candus, mm -hmm. and Multi, and with your books too. Mm -hmm. uh, so you did a freelance, uh, you, you as a freelance designer, and you did any kind of project based on typography, lettering, custom typefaces, mono, monograms, and all kinds of projects on type. So I give you, uh, and you, are, you have a, a foundry type buttons. Yes. So it's really important to mention that. <laughs> and uh, so I leave you talk about your okay. projects now. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, uh, salut. Uh, merci beaucoup. Um, the three C at uh, Paris and uh, pour m'avoir uh, invité. Ok, je suis très content, mais je suis désolé, je n'ai parlé français. <laughs> so, that's all my French, so I'm sorry. But, uh, yeah, thank you very much. So, ok, I, today I'm going to talk about, uh, very briefly, about how I started in type design, and a bit of inspiration sources, and later I will explain in detail two very different projects that are mostly based in research and experimentation. So, how did it start? Um, I don't know, I mean, because I didn't know who was joining this talk, I just do a little introduction about this. I mean, as many of you already know, I have a foundry that is Typoton, and this was my first try as a type designer when I enrolled this foundry in 1992. Uh, I joined Typotons as a group of four people, that uh, this is uh, me in that time, <laughs> uh, with uh, black hair. And this uh, group of people came from graphic design, but also music, programming, art, illustration. So what we had in common, it was our passion for, for typography, but uh, we didn't know how to design typefaces at that time. And it was a moment where everybody was discovering how to design, closer, okay. How to design typefaces uh, from not knowledge because we didn't we didn't got trained at that time but we got the computers so then we could experiment with it and this is how mostly start this is our website if you want to have a look to our typefaces so cortada was my first typeface and and you have to have in mind that as i said calligraphy and type design was not present in the design studies at the time well in 1992 when i joined typotons i was still studying I was still a student of graphic design. And unlike other countries where you have typography in your studies in Spain, we didn't, so there was no tradition. So for us, it was a, a very intuitive way of going into a type as drawings. Just draw letters, and maybe eventually this can become a typeface. And this is uh, 
my exercise, I did the first exercise in Photographer to just to learn the software without curves, trying not to do something very simple, but also very naive. And it was only when I enrolled Type Media in, in 2003 in The Hague when I learned how to, how to become a type designer. So thanks to this philosophy of learning by doing, we were trained in different tools. So we were doing uh, letterpress printing and programming and stone carving. And this was a way for me to discover how to design typefaces. And of course, calligraphy, because calligraphy is uh, something that I never did before. And it was, for me, the big revelation. I learned calligraphy as a structural tool, not calligraphy to become a calligrapher, just calligraphy to learn how, which is the structure of the letters from, with two different tools, the brownie pen and the, and the a pointed, a pointed pen. And we practiced these two styles of calligraphy to understand the construction, understand the constructions of humanists, of uh, typefaces like Garamond, for instance, but also with the pointed pen, understand the contrast of a modern typeface. But also, uh, I got in touch with these concepts of uh, contrast, design space, optical sizes, and all this, no? based on the calligraphy. So this uh, sentence this, that is extracted from the text of uh, Jerry Northside is a bit like the the motto and the philosophy of the Academy in The Hague, where calligraphy qualities underlies all letters. And this is uh, my way for starting to do type in a more, uh, let's say, professional way. So the project I did there was Roomba. So these are the sketches of this typeface. It's, uh, for me, it's always uh, very surprising to see the sketches, because now this process is really into me, <laughs> doing calligraphy. But at the time, when I started to put, try to translate calligraphy into typography, was qu quite difficult. I struggled quite a lot because I had no clue. So today, with the students of Thai Paris, we were practicing this methodology. And this is uh, something that uh, helped me a lot to, to understand how letters work. So the project I did in Type Media was based on everything I learned there, different kind of contrast, broad pen, pointed pen, and text typeface, display typeface. And let's say that this typeface gave me the opportunity to start being a graphic des a type designer. So my reference and inspirations uh, can be very personal, but uh, generally I admire people who choose alternative ways to, to do design and to do type. And these people, with the time, for me, their work look better and better. You know? So my first... Um, it's person is Uriel Miró. Uriel Miró, uh, when I finished Type Media, I did, um, I did uh, some courses of calligraphy, and Uriel Miró was my teacher, and he's still my teacher, so I'm still a student. I'm a student of calligraphy uh, always, all the time. And every six months, he organizes uh, a seminar of uh, calligraphy in a mountain, in a, in a sanctuary, and we go there, 20 people, three days of calligraphy, and we go deep into different styles. And these styles of calligraphy is what allows me to, to learn more about different styles, not only the ones I practiced before. Another uh, source of inspiration is the lettering in, in cities. I have an Instagram account where I collect the pictures I take from lettering in cities. For me, it's like a sort of uh, lettering catalog, and I use it for, for also for my work. And of course, lettering and typography books, and also books that I only collect by the covers. I really like uh, second-hand bookshops, and every time I go there, I always find something because related to these artists that were doing uh, lettering for the covers, and I try to collect them. And of course, designers, that uh, like uh, Louvalin and Carnas, that uh, were some of the first using um, typography as a sp specific typography as a, as they work. And Paul Rand, that also Paul Rand for me is a huge reference in graphic design. But also when I see his book covers and I see the use of the handwriting in covers, it's, it's really inspiring for me. Or oh, William Sandberg, that is a, a master in using photography with uh, typography and also doing this uh, this style of letters that are 
uh, cut it with a tracing paper and getting this texture. And, of, and then Wiggins, that is a big reference for me for this uh, uh, way of thinking, developing type in, in his own intuition. So um, for me, all of them share this, uh, this idea that uh, letters are abstract forms, but we can give them a meaning beyond what's written. And this is my, sort of, of my, my, my field. So in one hand, we have what we read, and then the other hand, we have what we see. So there's the content and the form of the content, and I always uh, try to move in this, how to put this thing. So in this field, what I do is lettering for logotypes. I mean, I'm an, sort of specialized in doing uh, brands, drawing letters for brands. And normally, uh, my clients are graphic designers or art directors, sometimes the direct client, that they are looking for this uh, uniqueness in, in, their, in their brands. And it's, uh, it's a mix of all my knowledge and a bit of intuition. So some of them are very calligraphic. Some of them are, are more uh, typographic. But it's a mix of, of the two things. No? And lettering works, helps my type design. And my type design helps my, my lettering. So these are the typefaces I have designed so far. So I'm in this, in this field. No? So for me, this is my sort of formula. I miss calligraphy with drawing, getting lettering, and then type design also gets the lettering flavor. So um, this thing of emotions is what, for me, is, uh, is my field of work now. I'm trying to, to make uh, a work, a, a bunch of work related to that. So um, and in this site, I'm going to yeah, explain you this project. Candus is a, type, a typography project that I started in 2005. And we finished uh, one year and a half ago. And it's uh, launched with the typographies, the typographies might make in, in the Maghreb. But I will explain a bit later. So first, for, for explaining to the project, I will talk a little bit about the Rabbit script and Tifinac script, because this project is, uh, is a typographic project that mix Latin alphabet with Arabic alphabet with Tifinac alphabet in harmonization. So uh, the, the Arabic script, the Maghribri, the Maghribri is, uh, the, is the term that, that uh, converts all the varieties of Arabic that are written and spoken in this area. So you have these countries, Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, and Libya. And then in Spain, in relation to what is, was the heritage of Al-Andalus, and the heritage of Al-Andalus also all the Arabic used there was the Maghibri style. And the Tifinac is the, is the, uh, the, the writing system for representing the Tamasig, that is the language of the Amasig, that are the Bereber culture. So and that's the area of the Tamasig is this, I mean, where, where uh, Tifinac is spoken is in this area that is a bit more spread out. There is, it's not so so general, but now actually is uh, offi only official as a language in, uh, in Morocco and Algeria. So in Morocco for 2011 and in Algeria for 2016. So it's a very reduced uh, language, but still in Morocco is very prominent. So there's a real necessity. So in, in Tifinac, as the difference of the Latin and the um, Arabic, in Tifinac there's no manuscripts. So the, the writing has been preserved for ancient times. But as these are the stage of the script uh, uh, carved on a stone. And these are what you can find if you are looking for, for, for these first examples of Tifinac. So this is uh, from the sixth century of, uh, in our era. And this is how the alphabet looks nowadays. And after a standardization done only in 2003 by the Ircan Institute Royal de la Cultura Masig. So they started to make to create tools for designers to be able to write also documents in Tifinac. So this is the, the common typeface they have now. But the reality of uh, this harmonization is here. You have here, you see some, some of the signs that you don't even have the French, so the Latin alphabet. You only have Arabic and Tifinac. So you can imagine how relevant is there. But uh, yeah, the lack of manuscripts so this is a manuscript, in, is, is a, is a Tamasig a manuscript, but written in Maghribri. And this is a Tamasig text written in Latin. So they couldn't write 
their own text in their own script because they didn't have a script for that because it was only coming from stone. So, so you could see that the language was there, but they didn't have the, the script, the writing system to, to reproduce it. So in 2003, they decided to do this alphabet to provide uh, designers and publishers and cultural institutions of this alphabet. But the reality is that the way it's used is, a steep, is, is very complicated. I mean, you can see Arabic with Tifinac that don't, they don't have anything to do together. So the lack of harmonization is a reality. So this is when we create Candus. This Candus is the project I did with Christian Sarkis for the Arabic and Juan Luis Blanco for the Tifinac, and I was charged on the Latin. And this project was created under the umbrella of the typographic matchmaking in the Maghreb project, done by the Hat Foundation, which curator is Huda Smithhaus and Avifares. And we were three teams, and we created, you have a sample on the left of all the Thai faces created, so we create three uh, Thai faith families uh, for for this, so and the typefaces uh, are going to be for for free, so a sample of the typeface for all the designers in the Maghreb. So to make a difference for you on the Maghrebi style related to other Arabic um, styles, so uh, when you look at uh, Arabic manuscripts, you have all this richness and it's very decorative and flamboyant. So it's, it's based in a lot of traditions, but basically you can differ to dif two main constructions. You have on the left something that is very fluid and very expressive, and on the right something that is more based on Kufic structure, so it's much structure and more, more rigid in a way. So these are basically the two structures of uh, the Arabic writing, and Maghibri comes in the middle. Maghibri is a mix of uh, something that is more Kufic and something that is more fluid. So, yeah. And there are not also, actually, not so many alphabets in Maghibri neither. So it was a real need of creating this. So the project started um, based on the manuscripts of Al Kandusi. And uh, these are the pieces of Al Kandusi that we were looking at. And you can see here that it's uh, quite uh, wild, uh, quite inconsistent. For instance, here, when you see in, in this image with the yellow circles, you see that the same character has different variations. And also on the right, you also see that this inlines is giving a lot of personality to the writing. So what Kandusi was doing normally in the Arabic scripts, the calligraphy, there's rules and there's norms to follow. But what Kandusi was doing, he was adding a lot of his personality to to the writing. Was quite, quite was quite uncommon on on that time. And you saw the manuscripts that were more sort of uh, normal in terms of weight and calligraphy. But this is. Also, what he was doing when he was going more abstract. And what he was doing here, he was adding drawing to the calligraphy. So he was not only doing calligraphy, but also adding drawing on top of the calligraphy. But, so it makes more a pictorial abstract thing. And also here, for instance, on the, on the bottom, you can see how he mixes something that is very fluid with something very square. -ish. So he was also giving himself these uh, licenses. So when we decided to work on this, we were looking at, at all the manuscript, and we could extract three weights, also based on the styles. So we decided to make a, a regular on the left that is more, well, these are the manuscripts. So a regular that could be more suitable for sort of text. Anyway, can do all the family together is most displayed on text typeface. Then the one in the middle is what we call medium. And is the one that is uh, more uh, strange, more personal, because he was starting to add drawing on there, and then he was already adding a lot of uh, peculiarities. So you have uh, the, the curly terminals, and then you have this huge inline. And then when you go black, this inline is even stronger, and it, all the letters get uh, different things. So. What we did in the first trip together, because this project worked in a way that we were having workshops together. So the first workshop was in Morocco, the second was in, in the south of Spain, Andalusia. So in the first workshop, we decided to, to put the parameters in which the typeface were going to be created. So it's a sort of dialogue between something that is more geometric and something more fluid. In the case of the Latin, is something that at that point was still exploring what is calligraphy, what is drawing. And in the case of the Tifinac, because there's no reference in manuscripts, 
uh, Juan Luis have to figure out how to match the Latin and the Arabic with the Tiffin and Shays, but it was a completely new field of the research and experimentation because uh, there's nothing like this actually existing like this. So this is the global concept of the project. The, the project proposes a dialogue between Kufic and solid influences and more organic fluid writing styles in Arabic calligraphy. So at the end, all the project became a study of the Maghibri style. And the, the Latin and the Tifina were based on the Arabic. So that this is something that quite special because normally the, all, along these years, the harmonization has been done in the other way, first the Latin and then the Arabic. So this is uh, the, also the, the challenging part. So the three scripts, I will go very fast through the Arabic and the, and the Tifina. So these are the three ways that Christian developed the way the, the project is still ongoing. So here you see that uh, the skeletons change as well as the contrast, but uh, you keep the same, the same structure. So they are all mixing these uh, solid and fluid structures. And yeah, in the medium is more peculiar, as I said before, and in the dark is when you have all this uh, experimentation ground. So this is uh, the aspect of, of the Arabic. And then for the Tifinac, as I told you, related to the stones, what he, what Juan Luis decided to do is to keep uh, very, uh, very much rooted in the stone carving because it was the only reference that he had. So he decided at that point to keep a very glyphic aspect to the typhi. So you can see the terminals, how the strokes end, that he has this sort of idea that was engraved. So what he did also, because normally the Tifinac, what you have in the Tifinac is the same height as the capitals in the Latin, but because he was very prominent, he decided to do the capitals a bit uh, smaller, to have a, more, a bit of more dynamism in the text. And yeah, and you see actually in the dark, in the bottom line, you can see the inlines coming from the Arabic, and everything becomes very cryptic, but it's very conic, no? Every character has a personality. Yeah, so this is how it looks now. And then the Latin, that I will be a bit more, more specific on that. So as I told you, we went first to Morocco. So in Morocco, what we did was to, for those who cannot read Arabic, like me, so the people who could read Arabic, they were reading Arabic for us and also showing us the peculiarities of the writing, but already from the vernacular uh, places. And then I had to decide how to do this because it was, as I'd say, coming from the Arabic. So I had to set some things in common with the Arabic, but without losing the personality of the Latin itself. So for me, it was exploration of the reverse horizontal stress based on rotation because Arabic uh, calligraphy is based on rotation and it has the reverse, the, the stress reverse to the Latin. Then I had to define how fluid and how solid it should be. So how expressive and how geometric, let's say, in a way. I had to define the limits between calligraphy and drawing because the regular way was more calligraphy and the dark way was much drawing. So also to see how much of drawing, how much of uh, writing in every, every uh, weight. And then also because the, the Arabic is, is, is a continuous writing, the only thing to simulate this uh, script of writing in, in a Latin without being connected was this uh, upright italic, semi-cursive, uh, with uh, some reminiscence of the calligraphy ductus. And finally, also have a look to the other scripts. And so it, it sounds like a lot, but actually these are the main features of the typeface. And everything revolves around that. I mean, there's nothing else in the Latin than this, which is a lot but there's nothing else. So our process of working was looking at the manuscripts of Canducci, he's Juan Luis on the left, and trying to learn how to, it's the calligraphy done in Arabic, because it's different, also the angle is uh, 60 degrees and also based on rotation. Then looking at the manuscripts and looking at the first sketches of the Arabic done by Christian. So. The idea is that, okay, I take a pen, and instead of doing 30 degrees, I go on 60 as the Arabic. And then instead of doing only translation, I also do rotation. What is very tricky, but is 
sort of that. So this is the result of these sketches. So when you, you move the pen, not only in a movement, but you also rotate it so to get to get this. So it was extremely difficult to abstract a complete alphabet from that. So I decided to go a bit back and start with a traditional structure, something that I'm familiar with, <laughs> not to go into something that I never did before. So I decided to, to build something that was a, a Roman construction, a normal let's say, but already with some of the features of a semi-cursive, a bright. So this was my, my study of proportions, of uh, which were the, the proportions of the regular weight. And this was my face sketches of the dark font that uh, they were too much, actually. It was too much on there. But uh, this is the result of, uh, of the this is between workshops. So we went in September to Morocco, and then we met again in November. So between September and November, I was working on my own, so October. <laughs> and, and this is what I developed for the next workshop. So the next workshop, we went to the south of Spain, we went to Andalusia, to Cordoba, to, to Granada first, and then to Cordoba. And then we went to La Alhambra of Granada. And then we could see all the calligrams that you have in the walls of La Alhambra. And then we have a specialist people reading us Alhambra. And it was extremely amazing. I don't know if you are fond of the Arabic culture, but if you manage to go to Spain, to, La, to Granada, be sure that someone reads Alhambra for you. Because it's a completely different experience. It was my third time in Alhambra, and I discovered many things I never knew before. And then something that was also a turning point in my project was to the lettering. So because I'm so much influenced by lettering anyway, then looking at the signs in the streets of, of Granada, and then you could see the influence of the reverse contrast, the Arabic reverse contrast in Latin letters. So at that point, uh, I decided also to put some Andalusian flavor in the project. It was not going to be only based on the uh, Arabic manuscripts, but also with my own ideas of what expressive lettering font could be. Because anyway, Candus was very flamboyant and very expressive. So I could also be very expressive and flamboyant. So it was a moment in the project, it was a, I think it was the most beautiful moment when we saw that, OK, now we know which is the path of every script. And it's not that we are copying or chopping parts of letters and putting letters, parts of letters in other letters. So Arabic script has these peculiarities and our Latin script has these peculiarities. So why I'm going to put the same features and attributes on these alphabets, but you know, in a Latin way, an Arabic way, and a Tifina way. And this is very important <laughs> because it was really important. So when I started to work on my structure, I started doing this reverse contrast because it was the natural way to explore it. Uh, and then we found something that it was to close the counters. And these closed counters had to get, gave a lot of uh, possibilities in terms of expression. But then still, we had this structure as the, you know, the minimal letter, letter I, that was a bit maybe too playful. It was not, not really there. You know. So I work on this alphabet as much as possible to realize that it was not working. <laughs> so I had to go far in the design to see that it was not working. So this is the evolution of the shape of the letter I. So because it was coming for calligraphy, I came back to something more calligraphic dutus, but in the Latin alphabet, and forgetting a little bit what was the Arabic origin, but trying to apply rotation. So this is the evolution of some of the characters. So you see in the first line, for instance, what is a C based on a Roman uh, cali uh, mm, humanistic calligraphy, and later how was the evolution from, uh, from horizontal stress to rotation. So this is the study of shapes, and it was extremely important for me. And then at that moment, I thought, OK, if I'm now coming back to calligraphy, why not to look at manuscripts of Latin uh, calligraphy that were based on rotation? Why only look at the Arabic script? Why not to look at uh, Latin calligraphy that has rotation? So then I started to look at the Manierist manuscripts. And then I was trying to understand which was the construction 
of, of these structures. And then I try to put all these in my, in my typeface. No? So here, the carat, this is the formal description. No? Rotation, curly shapes, pseudo calligraphy series, humanistic axis, expressive capitals, and Ibris shapes. Always, the hybridation is always there and always related to the Arabic. So this is how it looks. And then for the medium, because this uh, image that you saw before is real, very much based on this hybridation, so I decided to, yeah, to look af, at Latin alphabets based on calligraphy that are very crazy in con construction, also based on hybridation. So for that, I look at Gothic, but proto-Gothic proto uh, calligraphy, that it was really a field of experimentation, uh, and also the capitals of uh, Tobolpe, so trying to find something that is uh, more aesthetic. And then on this, based on this, I did sketches on, uh, actually the medium is the one that is the most challenging because it's the, the one that is more special. Uh, it's very crazy. So when you have something that is very crazy as a reference, then you have to be also crazy in a way but it has to be based on, on the Arabic, but also in the regular. So yeah, so I started to sketch. This is the one I work more on drawing. I mean, drawing by pencil than the others. And then you see already here some of these shapes that are coming a little bit from the Arabic, trying to already to match these shapes. For instance, the C, I did this uh, construction with the inline that the pieces don't touch together. So you have the capital E that is a clear hybridation with two constructions. So, but somehow everything is allowed in this typeface. And this is the funny part, you know? I mean, everything has a reason. So I could explain you letter by letter why every letter is done by this, like this. But there's a lot of freedom and there's a lot of enjoyment of uh, the letter forms. And then for the dark, that is the one more expressive. I also came back to, then I look at the civility types, and then I, these shapes that are close actually coming very much from civility. But also, I had to say that the dark and the regular were designed at the same time. So I was doing, designing both at the same time. And I left the medium for the last, because it was the one that, you know, need more attention, in a way, in terms of, of drawing. So then I found some things, because in the Arabic, there's a lot of ligatures. Uh, and then what I did in the, in the Latin is these ligatures, as the TH you see here, use them to over, overlapping. Instead of, of redesigning the shapes of the T of the H, I decided to do this inline in the, in the ligature. And for me, this is much related to, to something more pop, something more uh, display, something more you know, flamboyant. And it's a very, I, I think it's very nice. At least I like it a lot. <laughs> so this is uh, the dark, how it looks now with all this. Uh, you can see the numbers, for instance, if you look at number one, maybe you can, if for the image before from the Andalusian streets. So this one is directly taken from, from Andalusia. And these are the three weights together, how it looks now. So this is the texture of the three weights. And then as the result, of the project, here you have uh, the Arabic, the Latin, and the Tifinac together. And you see that is a common feel, no? I mean, you, could put them, you can put them together and you can really say that they belong to each other. Because there was a moment when we were developing the projects individually, then we put everything together and we, okay, that this series could be a bit longer, this can be a bit more curly, just too much, the other script but not really modifying the structure of the letter. So this is the Arabic, this is the, the Latin, and the Tifinac. Yeah, and this is the three scripts together. I mean, not separately, but together, because the, the, here you can see how the hates are related. Here you can see, for instance, how the Tifinac is a bit, uh, the cap is a bit smaller than the capitals of the Latin, because if it was the same height, it was giving a lot of, of, uh, of uh, darkness to the text in a way. So Juan Luis decided to make them smaller, sort of small caps, but taller. So the medium here, you can see, um, yeah. For instance, when you see the Arabic, you can see the inlines that later are there in some letters. And in the dark, you see very clearly that the series are something 
it's something very small. You have the series only when, when you have space, when you have some room to, to place the series. So this is, uh, yeah, all together. And then the project of uh, typography matchmaking finished after one year. And especially for the Arabic, Christian wanted to design a lot of alternates, a lot of alternates to, to give this uh, flavor of Kandusi, that he was doing a lot of alternates and every character was different in a different line, etc. But then it became very complicated, especially for the users. So if we want the users to understand how a Kandusi should be used, you need a lot of alternates. And then, you know, open type features, a lot of people don't even look at them. So we decided to split the project in three. So we keep what we did as an original, and then we decided to create another family that is the solid and another family that is the fluid. So the final project for retail, because this part is, belongs to the foundation and it goes for free, this other part will be for retail in the future. So we are working on that. So this is work in progress. So you can see already, as in the Arabic, this is the original, uh, re regular that you saw before, the medium and the dark. But in the solid medium, so what Christian is doing is he's taking another reference, it's not only for Kandusi. So he's looking at uh, a ca more uh, Kufic Magibri, and he's putting this in a completely different direction. And uh, yeah, so it's something completely different. I have to say, I only saw this uh, one month ago, <laughs> and I asked him permission to show it here, but this is work in progress, so probably the final phone will not be like this, <laughs> because Christian is always, all the time, developing phones. And this is the DAR, also based, based in something more Kufic, as you can see. So, and this is very capricious. So, and this came because he had an assignment to do a lettering for books for Lebanon, and he started to use Candus, but in the, he was using Candus, and in a moment he thought, okay, maybe I can do this, and I can do this, and I can do this, and he finished doing this. So he decided to apply this learning to his typeface. So, you know. And then in the case of the Tifinac, that this is something I think very interesting of the project, one of the best things of the project is how to do a solid structure for Tifinac and a, a fluid structure for Tifinac. So the very verse, they were writing on stone and also on sand. So you have the image there, so because they are living in the desert. So he, why not to apply this idea that something is in stone is more rigid and something that is in, in the sand is more fluid. So he decided to apply this concept to the typeface. So you see the solid tifinac on top, the one in the middle is the original, and the one in the bottom is the fluid that is more soft shapes basically on the sand. So this is uh, his system. And then for the Latin, it's a bit more complicated <laughs> because Latin, of course, yeah. I mean, not more complicated than the Arabic, but more complicated than Tifina. So when I had to go to, into a solid or into a fluid, um, but solid structure is something that is more constructed. So what is more constructed in Latin alphabet is something more like Dido or Bononi, something that is really on the drawing. So I decided to do a sort of inspired by uh, Didon in, in a way, because it's still very hybrid. And then for the fluid, I decided to go to a full italic upright with these shapes. So here you can see uh, the, the solid. Yeah, so it's yeah. some, uh, the serifs, you see it has a double serif here, and variable axis, drop instead of closet counters, so it's different. And this is the fluid, that is something that you can still see the Arabic thing or there, or well, at least I see it. <laughs> and then we have the fully tried construction, variable axis, knots, so on the application of knots. So this is the regular, you see the original in the middle and solid on top and fluid in the bottom. So now also in the fluid I'm working on some special ligatures, uh, only for uh, sore words. And yeah, so there's a lot of work in the ligatures for the fluid because, yeah, Okay, the fluid uh, it can be so many things. So in the medium, what they, we decided to do is to, in this case, the structure of the fluid will be the same drawing, I mean the same structure in the regular, the medium, and the dark. So the construction is 
not so crazy as in the original. In the original, the construction moves from regular to dark. But in this case, we decided to keep it a bit tame, because otherwise it was going to be too complicated. So for instance, here you see the E, what is the solid E, and the fluid E, so it's very clear. So the middle, <laughs> the middle, the middle it is uh, the hybridation of the two sides. So this is a, a quite a clear example. And then you see here with the ligatures on top, you have also this drop over there that makes even more, even that is solid, it's still very decorative. So yeah, so I'm working on that. It's a quite never ending project. Now I'm getting a bit worried about it because I really need to finish that. <laughs> but yeah, so you see the numbers, the numbers are really nice. So now I'm in this field that I decided to put the, the, ligat the, the swatches. Instead of putting the swatches out of the letter, I decided to put them inside the letter. So you have the P here with this revolving shape here instead of having outside because outside it gets a lot of space. So yeah. And this is the system. And now I'm going to try to be very fast because my time is running fast. I have uh, so 10 minutes more or less. And I want to explain to you what I did in Amsterdam. So I moved to Amsterdam uh, six months ago. And the last three months in Amsterdam, I was in an artistic residence. So I never did an artistic residence in my life. Uh, but it was a very special residence because the residence was happening in a printing workshop. So it was more like a graphic residence than artistic residence. But they were artists printing, so pre artists that were doing engraving or silk screen. So, so it was around. So this is uh, 600 meters of printing workshop. It's a former school, and the printing is in the former gym. So they call it the gym. And then I had to do a project. So I went there with no clue. Okay, I, I'm here. I want to be away for normal job for a while. I want to experiment more. I want to go more into lettering but designing from the contest. So I started to look at what the artists, how the artists use letters as a source of inspiration. So, okay, so how illustrators and, and artists go into lettering, you know, how they use the letters. And yeah, I have too many references, but it was a very nice process. Actually, I discovered a lot of people I never met, I never knew before. And on the other side, I was, uh, having these uh, three books of uh, reference. So the first one, Graphic Design Now in Production, is a book that is the catalog of an exhibition that happened in Cooper with in, in New York some years ago. And it was a, it's about designers that produce their work. So when designers become also editors of work, uh, can be being, doing posters, doing performance, doing events, whatever. So the second one is a book that explains why Dutch design is like this. It's, it's explained from the idealism. So when designers were working in politics and really thinking that design can change the world, that is something that somehow is coming back in a way. And the third one is a book by Ben Shang, who is an artist. Uh, and it's about the, when you are studying art in the academy and okay, you are out of the school and okay, now I'm an artist. Maybe, you know? So it's about how to to relate art with the real world, no? So, and then I got into this, and this idea of author as a maker, and authorship through print. So this was my conclusion, that I could, you know, make a, a speech about it based on printing. So I was also reading other things, and this is one of the sentences that I think is the most relevant. So the meaning of a word is not connected to how it's made, not just concepted. So, the idea that how you made your work is also part of the design, not only the idea of the design. It's, you know, it was my project was around that. So how I'm going to do it is part of the design. No, so I had to do a project that had to be an ideal combination of content and translation. So what I'm going to use as a content and how I'm going to translate this content. So. Somehow I became an artist in mine, apparently. <laughs> but at that moment, I was not really uh, perceiving. So I started to look to examples of, uh, of uh, this thing, that when people have to use design as a way of expression, and they also print it. So we, it was the celebrations of Paris 68, very present here in Paris. So it's, uh, it's a coincidence, actually. 
and also the, the feminist posters, that a lot of them are done with these uh, uh, really made uh, typefaces that you use very roughly, and also rizzo print and silk screen. And I also discovered the work of uh, Sister Corita Ken, who was a nun, and she was uh, using silk screen. Uh, she was print. she had a workshop. She became very important artist, actually. And she was using silk screen, but the way she was working, she was working with sentences taken from prints, and she was very active when it was the Vietnam War, and she was using these extras of text to, to give people, to talk about his spirituality to people, to believe in God, anyway, but using sentences from, from the time. So, yeah, so what I did was started to do Rizzo, so I came in, became, I got in love with a Rizzo machine, I don't know if any of you work in Rizzo, but uh, it's, it's really pleasant. And then I mix uh, Rizzography with silk screen, and I was using the same methodology as uh, Sister Corita Ken, that instead of making screens, I was doing stencils, cutting letters. Um, this was a trip, <laughs> you know. Uh, and then I started to design some posters that were related to this women's march, and you know, just to, to try the machines, actually. I had to print something, so design something. Uh, and then also because I take pictures of letters, as you already know, I collect some of the letters that um, I like it, and I t started to experiment rhizography with photography. And then I also prepared, was working with these uh, gradients and textures, so everything to, to get into the technique. So what I did was to uh, design some posters uh, based on an alphabet. So this is an alphabet. This is an on ongoing project. So what I do is I take one letter, for instance, the O, and I look for a concept that can be applied to lettering and type. So a letter can be ornamented. An alphabet can be ornamented. A letter can be joyful. An alphabet can be joyful. So an, a letter, uh, an letter can be hybrid. So I take the H and I make a hybridation. So, and some of them are only Rizzo, and some of them are Rizzo with silk screen. So here, for instance, you see this one also is the, the green and the red is in Rizzo. And sorry, the green and the, the, the blue and the red is in Rizzo. And then doing this is the green on top. So I was also learning. And then the more I was going into the project, I was creating some things that were more, mis more expressive. And what happens with Rizzo is that you don't know what's going to happen. I mean, when you have all these colors on top of others and texture on top of others. You don't know. I mean, you cannot, pre you cannot preview the result. So only when you are into the printing and you see it coming out of the machine, you get this idea of uh, what it can be. So it was very nice. So when you, you enjoy the process, later the result is really, really a surprise. You know? uh, this is more or less what I want to transmit with uh, this idea. So, this is, for instance, this one is the A of artistic, and this is my personal homage to Corita Kent. So I was also trying to find meaning to it, no? So I mix a poem with uh, this idea of uh, the art of, and then I mix life, because life it was something that it was in the poem, so I'm trying to, to go there. And then these textures that you see here, this is something that you cannot get with digital. And this is very nice. And I also was using calligraphy in some pieces and boot letters. For instance, for this one, I scanned the letters and I did the boot and then I applied some, uh, some calligraphy. So the idea was to work in the contest. So for that, all this content together, I did the magazine that I have it here. I can show it later to you. So I made a chapter with posters, a chapter with photography, and then a chapter with, uh, with these posters. So now I have a, a set of, of posters for that. And then I have an exhibition, <laughs> what is something that was also new for me. So the idea is the magazine will be presented in a box with a poster of the letter P. As it's a sort of artist book. And then f as to finish, so I, because when you have a, a lot of proofs, you have a lot of leftovers in a way. But these leftovers, you don't want to throw them away because it's, yeah. So then I decided to cut them, and I make little books here 
with uh, just to give to people in the presentation of the project. And then when I was doing this cutting, I realized that this collage, it was super nice in a way. And then the resident that was with me in May in, in Amsterdam, he is doing printing press. So he teach me that this is the beautiful thing about being in a printing workshop. He teach me how to do press printing. So I cut some cardboards and I create the shape of the collage and then I put it on a press and then I create two unique pieces that is this collage, collage number one is called, <laughs> and you have the, the imprint of the press there and then collage number two. <laughs> and, and for me, at the end of all of it, when I saw these pieces, I thought, okay, that's it. So I had to go through all this process of uh, drawing and printing and you know I could never do something like this in, if I was not going through this process and uh, this is the what I got actually you know so we have an exhibition uh, with uh, Elianu who is the, the other person who was exhibiting and yeah and just to finish this is my last sentence for me this what you design is the essence of uh, what you are and I have a feeling that if you are able to transmit uh, your own personality and your own way of thinking in two letters is a fantastic way of, uh, of working. That's all. Thank you. Merci. Only 14 years after its birth, the iconic Bauhaus School of Design was shut down by the Nazi regime. Many treasures and unfinished masterpieces were left behind, lost to the world. Founded on the central idea of training a new generation of artists to create a better world, Bauhaus laid the foundation for modern design as we know it and changed creativity forever. But in 1930s Germany, the progressive ideas of the Bauhaus were considered threatening and the school's closure became inevitable. But sometimes, what's been lost to history can be brought back. The influence of Bauhaus lives on, and now you can design with a piece of living history.